In today's world of 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year, there are online e-commerce sites and mission-critical applications. People use the same applications all over the world. Any downtime can impact a business with big financial losses. With so much at stake, database engines are expected to be available as much as possible to serve the critical client applications. You want your database available as much as possible. Availability is commonly defined as the percentage of uptime in a given period of time, like a year, quarter, month, or day. In other words, there's 365 days in a year. Was your system up 364 of them, or all 365? Imagine that you were just about to retire an old server that had been in operation for 15 years. During those 15 years, the server was down for a total of two minutes. This is an amazing achievement, but can you say this server achieved 100% uptime? Even if it's not a perfect 100%, how good could you rate this server? If the server's goal was to be up 99% of the time, then it could be down for one full day out of every 100 days. Or it could be down for almost four full days per year before it falls below the 99% mark. Another way to state this is that the server did achieve the two nines, or 99% of the uptime requirements. So what is meant by three nines? That means 99.9% .9 of the time the server was available. And for every 1,000 days of service, it could be down for 24 hours or less to achieve this goal. If you are down for one day or less during every 1,000 days of operation, you can say you've achieved three nines. Our 15-year-old server being down for just two minutes went well beyond the three nines mark. Since no single server in history can be up 100% of every minute for many years or decades, we talk about server uptime in the number of nines. If you needed five nines, it means you need the server to be up 99.999% of the time. So how many seconds per year can a server with five nines be down? Looking at this chart, you can see that to achieve five nines, you can be down for just over five minutes per year. Availability is most commonly calculated as a ratio of actual uptime and expected uptime. This grid will show you how much downtime you're allowed to achieve the level of nines required by the business. Measuring the server's availability and the number of nines might not reflect the real availability of the overall system. If your SQL server never went down, does that mean your customers never had a blackout period? To plan for a server that never goes down, you spent a little money and a little time to make sure it was very sturdy. Maybe for your storage, you had a RAID 10 array disk, backup power supplies, and a lot of CPUs, and let's say your server was down for one hour last year. Now, if there was a network outage of five hours per year, and your server was down for one hour a year, then you might have a total outage time of six hours as far as your customers are concerned. In this example, the outage time of the SQL Server would seem very low, but the applications trying to use the SQL Server would perceive a higher level of outage. This means the application's availability is another point of view to measure availability rather than just measuring the availability of the database. Downtime can be further classified into planned and unplanned downtime. Think of your car as an example. If it breaks down or gets in a wreck, that's unplanned downtime. You didn't know that car was going to be out of service. However, if your car is running low on fuel, you make plans to go to the filling station. While you're at the filling station, your car is not going to be able to run. So you usually plan for this at a time where you're not running late and you got a little extra time to bring your car down for this type of planned downtime. For servers, typical scheduled downtimes include applying service packs, cumulative updates on the server, or updates to the operating system. Unplanned downtime is generally caused by human error, software bugs, power failure, or even natural disasters. You'll hear the terms a lot, high availability and disaster recovery. And they are two different things. 
High availability is usually some sort of spare or failover system so that you always have an operationally available resource. Disaster recovery is a plan in place to make something that is no longer available to become available as quickly as you can. The goal of high availability is to never go down or at least prevent unplanned downtime. The goal of disaster recovery is to fix and recover quickly. Minimize your unplanned downtime. Now, if your car ran out of fuel before you noticed it, you could call that unplanned downtime. When the car gets low or runs out of fuel, we usually have got to take it to the filling station. After the car is filled up, it can resume normal operations for some time. The car is now again available. If your car runs completely out of fuel, do you have an alternative power source so it can keep on running without the fuel, without needing to stop? Maybe in the future when we're low on fuel during a sunny day, we can go a little longer. Or if it's at night and the sun's no longer out, maybe we can rely on our fuel source at that time. Having two available resources that by themselves will keep your system running is a form of high availability. The main difference between disaster recovery and high availability is disaster recovery processes do have some expected downtime. A perfect high availability solution has no downtime. Downtime can actually have more consequences than just the time that you are not operational. There's a term called RPO, and before we define it, let's walk through an example. Let's say refueling your car takes about three minutes and you discover on your way to work you do not have enough fuel to make it without stopping. This is indeed unplanned downtime, and you've got just enough time to get to work if you didn't stop. So you refuel your car, and now all of a sudden you discover you get to work, you're 10 minutes late. How can this be if my disaster recovery plan only had me down for three minutes? Now, had my car been able to stay online for the whole drive to work, then I would have stayed right on this freeway. But to refuel, I had to get off the freeway, refuel, and get back on afterwards. Getting off the freeway and back on it took another seven minutes. This means that I spent three minutes on my recovery time objective, or RTO, and seven minutes on my recovery point objective, or RPO. Recovery time objective, or RTO, is the time taken to restore normal operations after a failure or even a planned failover. Recovery point objective, or RPO, is the amount of time for which work might need to be redone after a disaster. In this example, there was an RPO because I had to get back on the freeway, and I was already on the freeway before this disaster struck. So I had to spend a little time in redoing some work. Let's look at disaster recovery in computer terms. If you have a server with critical business functions running fine today, it might have problems in the future. Natural disasters can strike no matter how important you feel your system is. If you have backed up your system, then you can get most or maybe even all of your data back. You need to restore your backup to a new system and get it up and running. If it takes you 10 minutes to restore your system, then your RTO is 10 minutes. If your backup was done at 8.30 and your system went down at 8.35, then you might have lost 5 minutes worth of data. How long is it going to take for you to manually enter 5 minutes worth of data? If it takes a technician 1 hour to hand enter all this data, then your RPO will be 1 hour. If you desire no downtime, then you might need a second system already set to take over before the original fails. A high availability solution will have a second server ready to take care of operations in case of a failure of the original server. Here we see two servers ready to act as our company's SQL Server. There are many techniques to make your system highly available. All of them have some sort of spare system as a fallback. This is known as redundancy. When you have redundancy set up correctly, then you can, in some cases, get your RTO and RPO down to almost zero. 
or at least almost to a point where it's not recognized by the customers or the business. This is because the redundant system can take over for the failed system. When using high availability solutions, you always need at least one system to take over in case the other one fails. The system being ready to take over is one thing. But do you want your system to detect the failover and switch this over automatically for you? Or do you want that process of switching over to be done manually? I don't know about you, but if the failure happens at 3 in the morning, I'd rather have it be done automatically. Also, do you want the data on this secondary server to be in real time, or can it have a little bit of a delay after the primary server has accepted the data? If there's a delay, then there could be data loss if the primary server goes down without sending all of the data. Now, most of the time, nothing goes wrong at all, and this secondary is sitting here with all this rich, important data never really doing anything. Since this extra hardware is mostly going unused, and it has up-to-date data, couldn't you run some nice queries and reports off of it? That way you've got real-time reports without taxing the system that's running your business. Some high availability solutions allow the secondary to be what's known as an active secondary, so reporting servers can use this real-time data. If your solution is a passive secondary, then you can't run reports against this server. There may be a risk of two servers going down at the same time. Do you want to have your high availability solution to have more than one secondary? Again, some high availability solutions will allow multiple secondaries, and some only allow one secondary. In Chapter 2, you're going to hear some terms like database mirroring, SQL clustering, log shipping, and replication. But let's do a quick introduction of these terms right now. Database mirroring is a high availability feature that can provide fast failover, but it only allows you to have one secondary. SQL clustering allows you to have many secondary servers, but has a limitation where the secondary is a passive server and is not usable for reporting needs. Log shipping provides reporting, but not in real time. The latency or delay of data from the primary database can mean some data loss or you could have an RPO. All of these solutions help you but ask you to give up something that might be important to you. SQL Server 2012 introduces the always on feature which pulls from all of the advantages of the past high availability solutions and has none of the limitations. This book will show you about all of the existing high availability options as well as how to use and upgrade to Always On. And that will do it for Chapter 1 on High Availability and Disaster Recovery Concepts. What do we got next? Chapter 2.1, Uptime Requirements.